Welcome to All Over the Map. Take chances and ask questions. Open discussion on all topics. The driving force. Get her done. Laughter is medicine for the soul. It's a small world after all. We'd like to welcome Jillian Brown to All Over the Map. And all over the map she has been. Jillian is an adventure photographer who lives with PTSD. She's dealt with numerous traumatic experiences, but through counseling, fitness, and nature, she was able to heal and now shares her story to help others. Jillian has shifted her mindset from thinking of PTSD as a stigma to using it as an empowerment. Perseverance, trust, strength, determination have now become the words of Jillian's PTSD. Welcome. <laughs> Jillian Brown to all over the map, our first lady, a special lady that has literally been all over the map. All right. So Jill, super serious question to get the ball rolling. Um, did you play okay. with Barbie dolls growing up? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I actually did. My dad built me a big, huge Barbie house thing. But my favorite thing was like coloring hair and cutting their hair. And then I would take them to my cabin and I would tie, this is horrible. I tied ropes around their necks and I'd throw them over the cliff and pop their heads off. Oh, okay. So that was like torturing Barbie yeah. dolls, not really playing with them. You're giving totally, them a hard, where was Ken the whole time? Totally did play with them. Yeah. It, I think it was just very different. I didn't play like house with them. I, I, was creative with them. I think that's a better way to put it. Nice. All right. So you've been on quite... <laughs> <laughs> now let's get serious. Real serious. That's a great one. <laughs> hey, I had to op op open you up with some sort of uh, humor, right? So, but that's serious. Humor. Yeah. Great. So uh, you've been on quite the journey in your young life. Um, you've been on quite the journey in your young life so far. So let's hear a little about your childhood, the good, the so-called bad and the ugly, and that ultimately led you to the BC wilderness. Sure. Uh, I had a really good childhood. I grew up um, going to school in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and the rest of the time I was out on a little island um, on Lake the Woods in northwestern Ontario, um, where I got to grow up with my great-grandparents, my grandparents, some cousins would come visit, aunts, uncles. Um, yeah, and, and uh, there wasn't anybody our age there um, as kids. So we grew up with our friends being our parents' friends and my grandparents' friends. Um, so I, I think it was it, to come to something. It, I think it was more of like a farm um, lifestyle upbringing. You worked hard. You learned to maintain the property and the cabins if you wanted to use them. Um, you had to bail the boats and learn how to winterize them if you wanted to use them when we were young. Um, it's a really, really amazing way to grow up. And I attribute that to who I became and how I live my life for sure. Um, my grandma bought her first canoe when she was 17. She worked and um, made enough to, to buy it for herself. And she still has it there. Uh, so that, I think that's where kind of the paddling came from. And uh, she's very high energy like I am too. So, <laughs> but so is a lot of my family. Nice. Um, yeah. And then uh, I was really athletic growing up, played lots of sports. Um, and that was kind of my first um, encounter with any sort of mental health issues was I started to get some really bad injuries, um, especially once I was a teenager. And I began coaching a lot too, to kind of over help overcome that to still be involved in the sports, even when I couldn't necessarily play. Um, but that was kind of my first real encounter um, with any sort of issue. And then yeah, went to university for fine arts and then went to a private photography school to study photography. And when I was done there, um, that was all in Manitoba as well. I was feeling pretty lost. Um, I had tore my quad. I had had a really severe concussion, lost some memory. Um, so I wasn't able to play sports anymore at that point. Um, 
So I really didn't feel like I had anything. Nothing was inspiring me there. I really didn't like the energy in Winnipeg ever. I always told my family that. Um, my dad, my mom has never forgiven my dad for this. My dad took me along on a business trip to Vancouver um, one fall and rented a car. I drove around, drove up to Pemberton, Squamish. And two weeks later, uh, <laughs> I packed up my Jeep and drove out to BC. Never looked back. Nice. <laughs> Um, I, I'm still not, hasn't forgiven my dad for that one. That's for sure. Well, Winnipeg, <laughs> BC wilderness, uh, you pick. <laughs> so nice. Um, yeah, I understand people living in Winnipeg. I'm just not a city person. So it's more that side of it. Um, for me, uh, than anything, Manitoba has so much beauty in it. Um, anywhere you go an hour outside of Winnipeg anywhere and it's beautiful, um, so I'm not trying to knock Manitoba or anything. I'm just not a city person is the biggest thing. Oh God, no. I remember actually going through Manitoba, uh, not this past summer, but the summer before and God, it was beautiful. Yeah. You know, I even had a good time in Winnipeg. I was there for like three days, took a little bit of a break and it was, you know, wonderful people. I mean, there's the good, the bad and the ugly, whatever our perception is on everything. Right. So, you know, sure. at, at the end of the day, it was you know, it was a great experience. And even growing up there, I'm sure you had amazing, amazing experiences too. So. Yeah. Yeah. There were definitely, there's lots of good people. I have lots of good friends there and my family's of course all there and everything. Nice. Nice. (laughs) All right. So you're a national and global advocate for mental health awareness and one of only five people in all of Canada that was chosen to be featured on a billboard by Bell Let's Talk campaign. That's an honor to say the least. What kind of responsibility comes with that? Oh gosh, that's a great question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think I already felt like I had the responsibility um, to to become one of the faces. You already have to be speaking and sharing your story, really. I think everybody that was chosen was already open about it. You have to have the courage to either allow somebody to nominate you or nominate yourself. So you already have to be at that point where you're willing to share or have shared. Um, So I I didn't feel any extra pressure from it at all. Um, I was already doing presentations at that point. I had already shared for quite a few years. Um, It was 2016 that I had my first article published by the Canadian Women's Foundation um, about, about my story and opening up what I'd been through. Um, so I had had a few years already, um, to, to share and process and, uh, talk to my family and friends. So I, I didn't really feel any added pressure from it. Um, it was definitely a huge honor. Um, and really excited. The best part about it was just meeting the other faces from it. Um, uh, they're absolutely incredible people and what they've been through. Um, it's an overcome is just amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. I was really proud of you. when I heard that that was, uh, you know, something obviously, you know, you go through what you got to go through. And then next thing you know, you're on a billboard and, uh, you know, it's not even about just being on a billboard. It's just giving you the opportunity in that platform where it's like, you know, now it's, I can talk about it more. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It opened up a lot, some, I shouldn't say a lot, but it opened up some doors. Um, Yeah, I got to be on a CBC documentary after that uh, on an episode where they were now talking about um, kind of the unseen disabilities and that that series had always been on visible disabilities. So it's amazing that they had made that shift and that they were recognizing it now. Um, Yeah, and I think that's really big and what's a big part of the Bell Let's Talk is that they've helped to make it um, not necessarily destigmatize it, but to make people aware that unseen things are, can be disabilities as well and that we need to recognize that and talk about it a lot more. But I don't know if it's really breaking the stigma of it too, too much. At least yeah. opening dialogue. Oh, as I was going to say, just opening up dialogue, dialogue is, you know, it's, it's important. It really is because so many people are scared to say when something's going on, you know, what they think is haywire inside and like, what is normal anyways? What's like, what is normal? You know, this new normal going on right now or the normal that was going on two, three years ago. It's like whatever your perception is. Right. I agree. I totally. 
All right. So let's hear all about the kayak adventure. <laughs> Raise awareness for PTSD that you did across uh, the Americas. Uh, what kind of pain and mental resilience did it take to pursue this selfless deed? Oh, gosh. Um, so I saw the pictures. A little background on that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that expedition, originally, I was brought on to replace three team members who were no longer going. Um, they needed somebody to document um, through photography and writing and who can paddle as well and keep up. Um, so through the other paddler and his sponsors, they came upon me and picked me. Um, which was amazing and a huge honor. Um, ultimately, I ended up solo on the trip. Um, their original goal was that they were showcasing um, an adventure for the sake of an adventure. Um, for me, it's always about overcoming obstacles. Um, it's always more than that. Uh, I definitely wish I had the opportunity to have more of a voice in that context. Um, but of course, now that once I was solo and afterwards, I can share all of those, those things and, uh, and the mental strains and overcoming all of the challenges on it, whether you're in a partnership on, on a trip or with a group or solo. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> where to begin with that trip? Um, there were a lot of, yeah, a, a lot of <laughs> obstacles um the partnership for one um having to to go along with a stranger i'd never met him um it, he wouldn't take phone calls so we had never spoke on the phone we met two days beforehand when he flew out to my place in bc um i i get along with most everyone and it's my job to be okay with that you have to if you're going to be a photographer and document things you can't be picky and be choosy and really have a lot of opinions because you're there to document, um, which is fine. That's, I understand that. And I'm probably the perfect person to be doing such a job. Um, but uh, it got to the point where it was, uh, it, it didn't matter that I was there to document or to paddle um, or who I was. Uh, he went through, I think six partners or people throughout it. It was, like I said, it was essentially the nice way to put it is that there was no longer room for his ego in another. Um, actually. So I ended up solo, which was amazing to have in my own personal sponsors. Um, and MEC went above and beyond to help make sure I was safe um, and had gear that I needed. Um, they would surprise me with chocolates along the way, which was awesome and really helped mentally. Yeah. Um, the hardest part when it came to the mental side was when I got to Baton Rouge and making the choice to stop there. Um, I think that's always the hardest part is ending before you feel it's actually over. Um, it felt like I was letting down sponsors, friends, family, all of the followers. Um, and I just went silent on social media for quite a while. Um, but it, it wasn't that I was tired or hurt or anything. It was just that I, what it wasn't safe. I didn't have the knowledge for the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I didn't have the person that had the maps. The person took all of the equipment, safety equipment, everything, and let, literally left me abandoned on the Mississippi River by myself. Um, and uh, so it, just, it wasn't safe, but it was still the hardest decision to stop. Um, I called my friend Dave Vander... I think I'm saying his last name right. Um, he's an incredible outdoorsman in BC and he's overcome a huge car accident and all of these things. And I talked to him for four hours, I think that night. And just like, you have to know that no, you're not letting anybody down and you don't need to explain yourself ever to make this kind of decision. Um, and now that, that's just always so hard. Um, mentally to, to feel like you're letting so many people down, um, even if you know that they're there for you. Um, and the only words that I ever got through being off social media for about a month that time 
was messages of people worried about me, checking in if I was okay, um, which did definitely help me open up about uh, why I stopped, but uh, it helped me kind of get through it. But that's the hardest. And then when you get back and you're done an expedition and you feel like you don't have purpose almost anymore, um, they call it post-expedition depression, but I don't, I don't feel like that. I just like saying you just, you finished a goal. You've finished something that you have set in place for some, maybe even years. And you've been working towards that. And then when it's done, you feel almost lost. Yeah, so like, I immediately just start planning expedition. <laughs> like post uh, expedition traumatic stress disorder. I know. Oh my God. I know how yeah. you feel. I know how you feel on that one. It was like a year before I felt like I'm still going through like the, the wowness of like, you know, crossing a country or whatever, you know, this is all about you. So I don't want to talk about me, but I get it. It's like, no, you know, no. <laughs> to sacrifice your, you know, your mind, your body and your soul to like, to do something so profound and for such a, you know, a definiteness of purpose, you know, such as like the cause of mental health, you know, especially PTSD, which you concur with so much. It's like, that must've been so, uh, I mean, exhausting, but at the same time too, just like the recovery time of that, just mentally recovering from that must've been just like exasperating. Okay. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't about, the physical I'd broken my foot while I was portaging over the um, continental divide. Um, I had blisters. I had lost toenails. I had, by the time I ended severe poison ivy and poison Oak all over my body that was infected. And uh, it wasn't that that recovery is quick and easy. And you don't really think about it. It's, it's fully the mental recovery um, on any expedition and afterwards. Um, and prior to it's the, the preparing mentally for it, you can do all the training you want, but if you're not mentally prepared, you're not going to be successful yeah, as well. But, and emotionally too, I bet too, it must've been very emotional, especially being out there on your own. Some of those nights and hearing all the crickets and the bears in the background, eh? <laughs> I know you like, well, bear. I know you like bears. <laughs> well, so when you're down south. I'm worried about like Crocs. snakes. <laughs> I, I'm worried about snakes. I'm worried about wild boars. I'm worried about alligators, crocodiles. I'm worried about all these things. Not thinking in the slightest wor about being worried about bears. And then I pull up on shore one day, and there's fresh bear tracks. I'm like what the fuck? They literally have everything down here. <laughs> oh my god, that's awesome. All right. So who was your biggest influence growing up and what is your true passion in life right now? Okay. Biggest influence I think is my, my whole family. Um, my parents, my grandparents, for sure. My great grandpa, um, just getting to spend that time with them, um, and learn from them. I, I definitely absorbed a lot. Uh, just the way that they live very passionately, um, very open. And they've always been supportive of whatever my goals were. They knew that I was going to be a photographer or an artist since I was a kid. Um, they knew I was going to be doing something athletic since I was a kid. And they've always supported me um, no matter what. Uh, so I, I definitely have to say my entire family, um, the drive and the, the sense of never giving up on your goals too is from them and working hard, really hard, whether it's something you love to do uh, like photography or getting a job to make your goal happen that maybe you don't like so much, but you're still going to put all your effort into it because it's there to make your dreams come true. That Absolutely. was always something that was instilled. So I, I, Plenty of jobs where I've worked painting, I've managed kids' clothing stores, and all because I wanted to, I needed the money to pay for a goal, to achieve a goal, like an expedition. You can't just go for free. It's a ton of work to try to do sponsorship letters and all of that side of things. That's going on too, but still have all your other bills and everything. So putting in that work and not thinking of it as just a job, it's this is going to get me to my goal. Yeah. Um, 
that was always really important. And they, they always taught me that for sure. Um, was the other question? Uh, right now, most important thing, my goals right now. Um, well, photography is always big, but I utilize my photography to showcase stories, like document, documenting, um, whether it be on an expedition or our campers at Camp My Way or my story. There's always writing accompanied with my photography and words and, and uh, sharing sharing something very open and honestly and very raw and candid. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always encompassed in whatever I'm doing. Um, but Camp My Way uh, is, is definitely high priority. That's awesome. Because uh, I get to share. Yeah, I get to have the opportunity to share the tools that I've learned um, with others who are where I've been um, and, uh, and help see the change in them, which is amazing. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's the big thing. That's what I, that's always been my goal since I started opening up is that hopefully somebody will be inspired or, um, it'll help somebody else. Yeah. You never, you never, you never know who's listening. That's the thing, you know, it's, and just being able to help even that one person oh. that, that you don't know. And sometimes, you know, you go back to like some, sometimes you have to do what you don't want to do to get to the place where you can do what you want to do. So it's like, you know, working towards that goal. Yeah. Sometimes we got to do things, you know, to make that goal happen. And that could be yard work and not landscaping or whatever the heck it is. You know, you just got to got to do what you got to do until you get to where you want to go. <laughs> so, but it's not the journey. Sure. It's, a des it's a destination, yeah, exactly. you know, and, and, and the destination, once you get to that destination, yeah. there's going to be another goal. So you never really get it done. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But, Endless goals. If you don't have goals, you're not, you're not going anywhere. You need to have goals. Even if it's just clean your dishes that day, yeah. like, you need to have a goal. If you don't have goals, that's when people get stuck and lost. hundred percent. So what advice can you give to people that suffer from any form of mental illness and some sound advice uh, with the coping and uh, obviously the mental uh, coping with the mental and physical pain? Oh, there's always so much. I get asked this question all the time and I always struggle with an answer because um, it's easy, but it's not um, like all a person needs to do is start is go out to nature and get fresh air, get some exercise and connect to the world around them rather than thinking that being online is connecting to the world around them. Um, 100%. Like go out and smell flowers and go talk, have a conversation with a squirrel. I always tell people, no matter where you are in the world, there's squirrels. Squirrel go, talk. Have, go have a conversation with a squirrel. A squirrel has taught me the meaning of life. Really? How's that? So after I left the that abusive relationship, which, yeah. um, which is what caused me to get diagnosed with PTSD, um, and uh, a year later, I took a road trip across Canada to reconnect to all of my passions from paddling to photography to nature and open up about what I had been through with my family because I hadn't. And I had essentially cut them out of my life for five and a half years. Um, and that was when I had this article published in the Canadian Women's Foundation. So I got to Quebec and I hadn't talked to anyone, seen any wildlife in two weeks which is very unlike me. Um, normally those kind of things I draw in. And so I felt like I was putting off just the worst energy and I was in a really bad headspace and I was ready to scrap every goal I had set for my trip at that point and just head back to BC. Got it. And I, I would have boiling, felt sorry for them. <laughs> so I was boiling. So I was boiling water from my oats at this picnic table in uh, Gas Bay National Park. And there's a little squirrel sitting in a tree above me. And I grab my camera. I'm like, oh, you're so fluffy taking some photos of this little squirrel. Turn back to my Jeep to put my camera away. Turn around and this squirrel's climbing down the tree and is helping himself to my breakfast. I'm like, what are you doing? That's mine. Grab my camera. Took photos of this whole thing. Go over and grab my spoon. Try to take it from him. And I proceed to hand feed this squirrel. And he just sits there 
and shares my breakfast with me and allows me to say what I needed to say. He uh, did, was completely unjudging of everything I thought I was giving off. I could have squashed him so easily and he didn't care. He was willing to share space with me and allow me to sit in his space. And yeah, I just, I've always told people that that, that squirrel taught me the meaning of life. Um, it gave me the strength to keep going. Um, as I was so judging of, of who I was at that moment and what I was giving off to the world. And yet this squirrel didn't care at all. It was only me who felt that way about me. Um, and it really, it allowed me to, it gave me the strength to, to accomplish every goal that I set on that trip, paddling in all the great lakes and all the oceans, every province, I talked to my family. Um, yeah, it's just all because of a squirrel. <laughs> it's amazing what we can learn through animals and nature. This is, yeah. you know, there's no judgment really at the end of the day. So which leads yeah. into the next question. Um, so if I, I know from my own personal experiences that people do judge people from the outside and what they see. Let's talk about what it feels like to be judged uh, when other people have no idea of all the hurt and the pain and the millions of others that suffer on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, <laughs> am I allowed to swear? <laughs> yes. You're fucking right. She can. Fuck them. Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, people are judging you in your life like what are you looking at i'm hurting inside i know i look good but uh you know <laughs> it, it, it was because of a stranger i sat down next to you in squamish that i was able to leave that abusive relationship because he didn't judge me his family didn't judge me his friends didn't judge me and i had felt judged by everyone at that time and they took me in like family like i had been in their life forever um and it was because of that stranger just saying hi, essentially, right. um, that I was able to leave. And I think that is the most important thing we could possibly do is to feel okay to just talk to anyone. And openly, if you see somebody that's sad, don't think this happened to me. So this is what I'm going off of. Don't say, oh, that person's just a cokehead. Like, why are you bothering? He's had 20 drinks tonight. Like, he's just an emotional drunk. Like, he's probably emotional because of something. Yeah. Like, yeah, he's extra emotional because he's drank some. But what's the hurt? Nobody else is talking to this. What's the harm in just asking, are you okay? Yeah. I, and I, I, I've done that. And the person is sober now. And has touched because I asked if they were okay and they looked at me bewildered that somebody cared that they didn't know, especially. But like there was everybody there knew this person and nobody asked if they were okay. It took a stranger to ask if they were okay. Hmm. God. Like, <laughs> I, I think if there's people that are judging, you don't want them in your life, get rid of them. Because your friends and your family won't judge you, shouldn't judge you. If you get addicted to something, they shouldn't judge you for that. They should ask why and see if you're okay. Yeah, 100%. There's always underlying issues, you know, behind alcoholism, addiction, all these different things that go on. There's, it's just, I mean, it's, it's really tough to compartmentalize a lot of it. And, you know, especially these days, you know, there's, you know, a lot of the, the stigma is being, you know, released and all this kind of stuff and whatever you know and, and you know thank god there's places like camp my way that people can go to you know to overcome some of these you know certain issues that they've dealt you know gone through in the past but um um let's talk about solution-based ideas such as the importance of diet uh setting healthy boundaries and moving forward with dreams of a better world built on understanding yeah <laughs> Um, this all seems so simple. I mean, yeah, everyone knows don't eat healthy. Yeah. You should be act physically active. Um, we can't, we can tell people that we can show people that, but we can't teach willpower. We can't tell people, we can't teach people to want to live. They have to want to live for themselves. Yeah. That's, that's it. That's what we say at my way when, 
when we have people get emails all the time from parents, from friends, from spouses saying, my partner, my friend, my son needs to come to your camp. Okay, well, let's talk to them. Are they ready to put in the work? If they can't even have a phone call with us, they're not ready. They're not at the deepest, darkest depths yet. Because once you're there, you're going to put in the work Yeah. to, to well, live. A lot of it just comes down to self-discipline, right? You know, and cre- it just, oh, yeah. Yeah. We're, we're creatures of <laughs> habit. So creating those habitual components, obviously, that, you know, comes into our, not just our awareness, but our f- whole physical well-being and everything all put together. It's like, you got to be willing. I mean, it takes hard work to yeah. get well. If it's taken that long to get unwell, yeah. it's going to take a little bit of time to get well again. So you got to be committed. Yeah. The the number one factor is environment, a person's environment. And it's the hardest thing to change, to realize, okay, I'm in a bad environment. I need to move out of the city. Okay, well, that's a huge thing. You need to have money. You need to do this. Or you think you do. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Your environment is what's causing you whatever's going on in your life, whether it's happiness, anger, hurt, addiction, it's your environment. It's your lived experience leading up to that point. And now you're in an environment that's allowing you to do those things. Yeah. You have to be ready to remove your environment. If you stay in the city where right by Hastings, where drugs are easily accessible, you can go to detox, you can go to a treatment center. But if you return to that same spot, I can guarantee you're going to get addicted again. Absolutely. Yeah, we're just a byproduct for our environment. We're the sub and substance of the people that we associate ourselves with the most. It says, you know, it's just energy attracts like energy. You know, you hang out with a drunk, you're going to probably end up drinking and maybe be a drunk. You never know. You know, it's you hang out with healthy people that do set boundaries and whatnot. You know, you take on those habitual components. It's really, it's simply, unsimply that simple. (laughs) <laughs> you know it's just a matter of just, <laughs> it's just a matter of making a choice it all comes down to you know the power of choice it's, you know and the power of intention and and courage you have and to courage. have a lot of courage to do that because you have to be willing to potentially leave your entire world behind mm-hmm. it took me five and a half years of being in that abusive relationship to come to that acceptance of i'm gonna have to leave everything for me to be okay right Everything from family, friends, my businesses, my home, my, the person I thought I loved, everything I'm going to have to leave. And it took five and a half years. But that, that, it wasn't the courage. People say, oh, you must be so strong, like being in that and surviving and stuff. That wasn't the strength. It was the strength of knowing I had to leave and actually doing it and being okay to go and be homeless for seven months. Yeah. What was that like being, on, being homeless? That must have been tough in the beginning. Eh? The, the best thing that could have happened to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, would... Sometimes we think the worst things that are happening to us end up being the best things that happen to us in the long term, eh? I, I, I wouldn't have found the healing I did if it hadn't been living in that tent for seven months by a river. Um, although it was where I thought about killing myself for the, o- the only time. And that's when I went to a therapist. As soon as that happened and that thought came into my mind. I immediately dropped my dog at my tent and went to a therapist to find out what was going on, which for me, there uh, that didn't work. I had PTSD for the first time, which was terrifying, and I wasn't told what it was, and I didn't connect with that therapist. Um, it, it didn't work for me, but uh, but I learned everything I was doing there was what I needed. I didn't need a huge, beautiful home. I didn't need this person to protect me or make me feel like I was protected. I just needed my, my dog who made me feel safe and gave me love no matter what. Um, and exercise. I, I didn't get a job for quite a while. And all I would do was go and hike and work out on my hikes. And I'd go and bathe in the river. Um, yeah. And I tell people as much as they considered me homeless, that was the best home I could have ever had. Yeah. And probably just a beautiful time for self-introspection, you know, being able to actually kind of, you know, put the pieces of the puzzle together and realize why you were, where you were at, at that certain time. So yeah, that's. Uh, there, yeah, there wasn't distractions. Yeah. Uh, Cause it was just me and my dog. I could go out and I, I just connect to being human again. 
I'd explore, I'd let my dog off her leash and I would just follow wherever she went. I'd be crawling up cliffs and through bushes and stuff, just following. And all I was thinking about was what's my dog following? I wonder what we're going to see. And like, then I, because I'm crawling, I'd see mushrooms. I wonder if I could eat these. Like <laughs> everything that is our human nature that we nice. block because of technology and because of our jobs and because of the pressures of society, yeah. everything from our natural existence, we've cut out and I was doing it again and it was healing me. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So do you think there's more women in the world that suffer uh, from PTSD than men? Do you think men hide um, it more maybe? I think they probably do because they, it is, might just to have emotions as a man. Um, so I think in that context, yes. I think the biggest issue when it comes to PTSD is that the stigma is that it's only military and first responders that suffer from it. So in that context, a lot of women don't get diagnosed because they don't realize or don't get the help because they don't realize that being in an abusive relationship or having something like that, a miscarriage. Um, it's all just lived experience. So anybody can have it. A kid having their tooth pulled at five years old, that's traumatic to them. Your nervous system doesn't associate, doesn't know that whether it's a gun being fired at you or your tooth being pulled. Your nervous system has no idea. It's a lived experience that's causing fear and for a five-year-old, that tooth being pulled is just as traumatic as a gun being fired at a 35-year-old in Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. I was having that conversation with the gentleman the other night at, uh, at the dinner table during a, our Thanksgiving feast, you know, that the subconscious mind records nice. absolutely every single sense impression from the time we end up on the scene here in planet Earth. And, you know, sometimes reliving all that kind of stuff, it's, it's you know, until we make peace with it, I mean... I mean, there's times in the last uh, even week, I mean, all of, just a honk on the horn will even set me off, uh, you know, as a trigger. I mean, that's why I can't stand being in the city either. That's why I got the heck out of Vancouver. It was just too much for me. You know, it's, it, it's just, yeah. I, I mean, if I'm not connected to nature or, you know, you know, people that are on that same wavelength of just like keeping it simple, it's like, I give a shit about BMWs and Mercedes Benz and all that kind of stuff or whatever. I, I mean, it's just, just having that connectivity to feel good and being like, okay, in your own skin. And, you know, it's just when you're around all that energy and you're sensitive to it, and especially when you, you know, people that have been through, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, you know, they're more sensitive to other people's energies I find, and it can be very overwhelming. Yeah. So this is, what Terrence taught me um, about PTSD, which is what she about PTSD is it's just energy. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's a buildup of energy. We're like a car battery. This is straight from Terrence's mouth, by the way. Can't okay. take credit. You can quote it. We're like a car. <laughs> we're running on. 12, we're running on twelve volts at all times. But when we have lived experiences that makes our voltage go up and up until we're over, till we overflow. And that's when things go wrong. Um, and we need to find ways to move that energy. We're not getting rid of it. There, it's always still in us. Yeah, it's just like unre unreleasing the pressure valve. People want to be healed. You're not gonna be healed. You have energy in you no matter what. You need to move it. Yeah. And everyone has different tools. Some people talking to a therapist is moving that energy. Most ever, I can say everyone is going to move some energy if they get exercise. Everyone's going to move some energy if they go out in nature. But there's plenty of other tools out there, journaling, podcasts, talking to others, all of those things. There's yeah. so many things, art. But it's it's just energy that we need to continuously move. And when we start to get sick, when we're at a point like when in my, where I was at after five and a half years, my body started to shut down. I was sick. I wasn't sleeping. Um, I was told I had IBS, like irritable bowel syndrome, all these things, but it was my body trying to physically move that energy that was within me. Yeah. 
Yeah. It was trying to do the work for itself. I would cry. I would break down. I'd get angry. I started to have mood swings, all of those things. That was my body doing exactly what it was supposed to do. It was trying to move that energy because I wasn't moving it. So when we do those things like cry or get angry or any of those things, we're doing exactly what our body is supposed to do. 100%. Move that. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing acupuncture a lot uh, lately and that's been having a huge benefit, you know, just hitting all the energy meridians and like, I mean, before I go in, I feel sometimes a little like down on my energy is like really depleted. And then all of a sudden after I come out of a session, it's like, I'll ball my eyes out for like 20 minutes, like a little kid and just be like, Oh my God. But then after I get that out, I'm like, yep, all the energy's moved and I start feeling better. I start, my energy starts raising again and becoming more balanced. My brain starts to come into homeostasis. Next thing I know, I'm at the gym and I'm feeling great. To, and, you know, then I start attracting better things to my life, you know? So it's like, you know, everything is energy anyways. So it's like, you know, yeah. if, you, if you can get into vibrational alignment, so to speak with source, you know, um, Source doesn't want us to have energy blockages. Those energy blockages have been put on us through, you know, certain uh, circumstances that have happened in our lives that, you know, it's like they're never going to go away. They're still recorded, but it's been able to move those energies around is what we're getting to. Right. Yeah. 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 We had to have Terrence on the show for sure. Um, yeah. 100%. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll keep my mouth shut on some of that then, because otherwise he'll just repeat what I said. And okay. Talk much about it. Like when I was told PTSD by by a therapist, by a psychiatrist, there it was just. I think you. Oh, bye. We'll see you next week. Okay. There wasn't even like what PTSD stood for. It was. I think you have PTSD. Have a good night in your tent. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Uh, here's a per, here's a prescription for something <laughs> that I immediately said no medication I knew that from the start I've always been that way since yeah. I was a kid I have always not wanted to take medication um so so I always that was never never a question that that was gonna happen mm -hmm. or not happen so uh yeah you're obviously in tune with post-traumatic recovery uh, tell me a little bit about Camp My Way as you've been telling a little bit about it, but I want to hear like the whole demographics and, you know, what, it, uh, you know, the, what's the target, you know, for Camp My Way, this, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful surroundings, obviously. I haven't, uh, I was supposed to go up there a few times and see you guys, but, uh, you know, we get busy sometimes, but, uh, really want to hear our listeners to, to, you know, to hear about the, you know, the purpose behind Camp My Way and obviously Terrence and you guys are, you know, the, you know, the building blocks and uh, the key figures that, that stand behind it. So um, yeah, tell me a little bit about Camp My Way. For sure. So Camp My Way is a wilderness well-being program, okay. the simplest way to put it. Um, it's really for anyone, but we say first responders, veterans, at-risk youth and their families affected by PTSD. So anyone that has energy trapped within and needs the tools to learn to move it. Um, what we do is when campers come up, um, we take them out into nature. We do everything that I was just sharing with you. We journal every day. Um, we practice within the journaling, forgive, be thankful, and a goal always, or your intention for the day. We go for a walk. Um, we do exercise and train and we push hard because um, you got to learn that you have to put in that work and everything we're teaching here are things and tools that you don't need any money. You don't need any support from anyone else to take home and do for yourself. That's the biggest thing we're giving you tool. We're not, we're not making you steaks and pant rubbing your feet like at detox centers or rehab centers and then sending you on your merry way back into your shitty environment. Yeah. We're giving you tools to take back with you that you can um, implement in your own life. What it, whether it's just one of them or all of them. So essentially, 
we like to tell people, it's like we're taking you to Home Depot and we're walking you down the aisle and teaching you how to use each tool, but maybe the screwdriver doesn't work for you. Maybe that tool doesn't work for you, so you put it back on the shelf. But we get to the hammer and you really like the hammer. So you take the hammer at home and you use it. Well, maybe in a week or two or a year, you find that hammer's not working so good anymore. So you go back to the screwdriver and you pick the screwdriver up. Yeah, 100%. And the way maybe you filled your shelves, maybe you have a ton of tools in there. And maybe you're picking and choosing a few tools or one tool. Um, but, but that's that's really it. We go, we have fun, we push, push people, we talk. Um, the biggest thing is that we focus on the now, the present moment. Mm -hmm. We don't ask you about your past. It doesn't matter. You're here. The big thing is to be here and be present. Yeah. Yeah. Everything else is just an old story. Even, even 20 seconds ago. We all have them. Yeah. We all have lived experiences. We all, the judgment comes that we think our lived experiences is so different from others. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter to you your car accident was just as traumatic as going or just as painful as having a divorce to somebody else. Who are we to judge? Who are we to say your car battery is the same as mine? Well, no, your car is totally different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always say we're, we're stronger than we think we are and we can do more than we think we can. Yeah. So, so yeah. this is one of my things from expeditions is it, it drives me nuts that a lot of explorers and people say, I'm just an ordinary person doing extraordinary things. And I absolutely hate that because we need to give ourselves more credit. And this, this is not an ego thing. All of the things that explorers and adventurers and athletes do, anyone can do. Yep. There's nothing, ex there's nothing. The mountains are there for anyone. The rivers are there for anyone to paddle. The extraordinary thing is that those people that are achieving those things have connected in belief in themselves. Anyone can go and train their heart out to do those things. Anyone is capable. Blind guys paddled the Colorado River. Anyone, if you want to do it, you put your mind to it and you Beethoven believe Beethoven was blind. <laughs> right? Like, these are the... the, the it, we, yeah, nothing is beyond what you believe you can do. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Whatever the mind believes and conceives, it can achieve really, you know, the only limitations are yeah. the ones that we put on ourselves. I was just saying, unfortunately, most of those are because society puts them on us. Absolutely. Puts those boundaries. Yeah. Society illness. That's what I call it sometimes. And we're being... <laughs> We're being like overstimulated with an over influx of information in these days anyways, you know, app here, app there, push of a button, you know, in nanoseconds, a photo can, you know, go from here across the world. It's like, it's overstimulation, you know, and, you know, through the vibration of the ether, think about all the phone conversations that are going on and just rippling through the brain waves and the neurotransmitters and all that kind of stuff. It's like, how can it not be overwhelming if you're living in a city like, say, Los Angeles, you know, where it's there's so many people, so much energy, so many people trying to get things done. And it's like you're literally in uh, it's like you're spinning like a one legged ducky poo. <laughs> <laughs> With all of that, we've lost patience and we expect instant gratification. Yeah. Which then has caused the biggest issue in mental health recovery because we're so brainwashed to think that we should have instant gratification that we're let down when we don't get it. Yeah. And the ones that have the instant gratifications are the ones that usually end up the most messed up, you know, or not. There's all kinds of different variables. <laughs> Human beings are so complex as it is anyways. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's all, you know, other people's different you know, perceptions and perspectives and whatnot, which uh, leads me to uh, like, do you believe that psychedelics such as psilocybin and even cannabis have a positive or negative effect on post-trauma? I can't really say much about them. I have only ever. I've, Gone camping and used <laughs> scratch mushrooms. Scratch that. I've never done. <laughs> I've never done drugs. Me neither. Yeah. <laughs> Only in a therapeutic um, environment with a shaman. No, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I have 
smoked pot before. Yeah. That's it. And it was many years ago in that relationship. And to me, it, it was helping me get through that um, at that time. And I stopped. I stopped drinking and smoking while I was in that relationship still because I figured out that it wasn't wasn't right. Um, I always had, I, I've always been very self-aware. I just had that question if somebody thought that uh, I'm more self-aware now. I've always been very self-aware and I've never agreed with those things so much just for me. I don't, it's other people's lives. It's their bodies. If they choose to do those things, go for it. Who am I to judge? I don't care. It doesn't affect me. If I don't want to be around a drunk person, I'll just leave, right? Um, and uh, so I can't say when it comes to those things now on how they work for healing. Um, I don't use them. Um, I, I like to think, uh, I mean, they're natural in regards to they come from nature, but uh, there's a lot of things that come from nature that aren't necessarily great for us and could be considered masking things. Um, I'm all about just utilizing what we have within us yeah. um, to get through things. And that's just being eating healthy, what you put in your body for food, what, what you put in your body in general, whether it's drugs or food um, or the air that you breathe. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have judgment on it. I don't know anything about it when it comes to the healing sense. It's not for me. Neither is therapy. Yeah, I tried every I'm not therapist. not going to say it's wrong for somebody either. else. It's just, you know, it's, it's sometimes, you know, tough. You, you know, you, you, a lot of these therapists, you know, they cost a lot of money and, you know, they studied out of textbooks, you know, they haven't really gone through the so-called great university of life out there and no, not to, you know, downgrade, you know, therapists and, you know, their willingness to help and, you know, be of service to others, but, you know, it's really hard sometimes for these therapists to understand what kind of experience you've gone through. You know, we've all gone through, you know, different experiences. Yeah. Yep. Okay. They might be able to give you tools, but guess what? Um, nature actually really has a lot of the tools just sitting right there. Healthy diet, you know, healthy thought, healthy movements, you know, like it's really kind of all there. If we just, you know, access it through our own, just to, not just our belief system, but just, you know, it's, right there for the taking yeah, and you're in the, you're, you're in the best place, uh, you know, to be able to do that kind of stuff. So, you know, I feel bad sometimes for people that are like, you know, in, in the flatlands where there's really not a, a whole lot of place to go, you know, getting into the wilderness is there's nothing like it. You know, it's. For sure. I agree. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, tell me about your love of photography. I know you're an incredible photographer and obviously the adventure that goes along with that. Thank you. Um, well, photography has been a big part of my life since I was a kid. Um, like I said, I was, I loved fine arts, drawing, sculpting since I was really, really young. Um, I, I don't know if you call it a prodigy, but I had a talent for it and my parents figured it out really young. So I was put into all sorts of art, art programs and classes. Um, I got my first camera when I was 12 years old, sorry, 10 years old, 10 years old was my first camera. And we were doing a road trip um, from either from Winnipeg to Toronto or vice versa. And I took a, a bunch of photos. It was a little Crayola camera, not a single one of them worked. And I swore from that day, I would never let that happen again, that I would miss those moments. Um, so at 12 years old, I started learning in a dark room um, how to develop my own pictures and I never stopped that's sick. That's <laughs> from awesome. there. I knew that's what I was going to be doing from that very moment. I knew that I was going to be a photographer and an artist. Um, yeah, I went through different mediums. I wanted to be a forensic artist. I love the human, like learning about biology and things like that and natural. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it just kind of developed into, to that and then when I went through all of the the relationship and that side of things and being in the tent um and doing that cross Canada trip I really realized that I could do all of my passions together mm -hmm. um it was going to be hard but I could make it work in some way paddling 
um, adventure, nature, and utilizing what I knew and what healed me and what was my passion to help others in some way, whether it was just to connect them to a photo of a pronghorn on a Saskatchewan Plains or, and sharing the story in my words or a photo of me sitting tired and exhausted and sore on the banks of the Mississippi river. Um, yeah, that's, I've just been very fortunate to have known what I'm supposed to do with my life right. since a really early age. So yeah, that's incredible. Um, do you ever get nervous when you public speak? <laughs> oh, I'm scared. So uh, this is, I, so I was back in Manitoba um, in March. I was asked to be a, uh, a speaker for three days, um, do five presentations at the Manitoba Boat Show and talking about discoveries on the water. So I was connecting it to healing and uh, learning about myself through all these crazy adventure stories of like world firsts and Canadian firsts and things that I never thought possible. And um, um, the second day, I'm on my second presentation. I'm like, man, these people in all these booths, they've heard me before. I got to switch it up. And that's when I got nervous and I totally blew it because I tried, to, at least to me, I blew it. Nobody else knew. Yeah. But I just tried to change it and in some way. And it just, for me, that was that threw me off. I got too in my head. I thought about it too much. Um, I always just go in just... That's why I told you before this, I'm like, I don't uh, just ask whatever you want. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk. I'll be honest. Do whatever you want. Like, I'd rather not know the questions because then I'm going to think about them and I'm going to try to plan something. Yeah. Everyone asks me, oh, what's your advice? I block that I've been asked that a million times because it, I'll just think about it over and over and over and I'll be fixated on that and then I'll screw it up. <laughs> know the feeling. <laughs> So what are yeah. your, what are your triggers? Don't say triggers. They, hmm, everybody's got normal emotions to things. So if, <laughs> if somebody's being aggressive towards me, I mean, I'm going to be scared, but everybody is scared when somebody's aggressive towards them. Well, like, yeah. I was just having this conversation uh, too. With another, go ahead. Carry on. I was having a conversation with someone the other day. It's like, you know, you're not allowed to be sad anymore. You're not allowed to feel these certain emotions. And, you know, yeah. it's like you go to the doctor because you're feeling down a little bit for a few days. And because something, you know, in your, in your perspective, bad happened. And the next thing you know, uh, you're depressed, but really it's not depression. We're, we're human beings. We're run on the human emotions. You know, it's okay to feel down. It's okay to feel a little bit sad if something bad happens or it doesn't work out the way you planned, you know? So at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, no, it's a, triggers. It's like, yeah. I mean, you can get triggered by the guy that bumps into you by accident at Seven Eleven. I mean, sorry. Oops. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not the end of the world, but I mean, I wouldn't like to have a gun put to my head again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a trick. That's a trick. Yeah, I never. Yeah. See, but that's that's the thing. Like, that's a literal trigger. Yeah. But that's not a. That's I think that's a big part of the stigma is like people think that when when things happen, everyone just has lived experience. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to react certain ways to certain things. It's not triggers. There's not like you're allowed to do those things if you have your Shit tools. Happens that you know like. <sighs> Breathing, yeah, breathing or going for a walk or doing some exercise, then you'll get through it. Going to the city for me, Terrence knows, going to the city for me immediately shifts my energy. Yeah. I'm on high alert. I'm anxious. I'm different, but I have to practice my tools to get through it because I can't just not go to our meetings and go to the cities. I ha I'm going to have to. So I need to have those tools ready to get through those things. Yeah. It's not, it's not triggers, just lived experience and we're going to have them. But I, I don't know. I think that word is such a, is a big stigma. I think I so, many, say, so many words that we associate. I'm getting with triggered people. right now. Uh. I, right? Like, okay. Okay. You're being triggered right now. Like you're putting yourself in a certain mindset saying that. 
Like, I would, that's, I will say there's that. so many things that social media and psychologists and doctors and people say and use to stigmatize these things that are just normal human reactions to lived experiences. That they can actually be making it worse. But I can, yeah, I do relate to the fact, you know, being from North Vancouver originally and then going across town, I can literally feel the transmutation of energy when I'm halfway across the bridge. I have to like, like literally, I, I pick up on it so deep that it's like, okay, get ready to go downtown. And, you know, having to put that bubble of energy around you sometimes and just be like, geez, you know, it's because uh, it can be pretty dark down there in some certain areas i mean everywhere all across, i mean it's the world there's you know there's there's darkness there's light but behind the darkness there's always light you know it's the yin and the yang it's uh, whatever <laughs> i mean there's so many different ways we can like go about it but i totally feel you and like you know going downtown you know it's just like there's so many people in boxes down there everyone's all cooped in and then when they're not cooped in it's like they're you know they're running around with chickens uh, like their head cut off you know <laughs> the rat race you know, yeah. it's like the rat race makes no sense to me. <laughs> that's, that's the, it's, it's overwhelming to every sense within your body, to everything that you're supposed to be doing. And that's supposed to be calm. You're, you're supposed to, you're like, as humans, we're supposed to be very aware to survive. Yeah. So to go somewhere that completely overwhelms every one of our senses it's no wonder that you're you traumatized, you're triggered, you're on your energy level is through the roof because that's not how we're supposed to be. Yeah, your amygdala is shaking like a so, rattlesnake. Yeah, if you go, if you train yourself and practice long enough and get in tune with it, when you go for a walk in the woods where there's no sounds or you think there's no sounds, you can hear everything from like a snail crawling along, you'll hear it move a leaf. If you remove yourself from that environment for long enough and connect well enough to yourself yeah. and to your surroundings, and you're allowed to actually breathe and take things in, you'll realize how little you need to be able to hear, smell, see all of those things. And then you'll realize when you go to a city, how fucked up it is on yeah. your system and, how, and your senses in your normal human nature. Yep. That's why I find like our higher, higher faculty, so to speak, that higher self part of us, you know, like kind of dissipates the, you know, the minute that you get into these large crowds and whatnot. And some people just are not as self-aware as the next person. And that's okay because they're just who they are and everybody's, you know, different in their own unique way. But I mean, even going, I mean, I used to love going to hockey games where there'd be 20,000 plus people screaming and obviously playing in front of those kind of crowds too. And I, I'd love it. It was like the coolest thing in the world at that time. I couldn't even imagine doing that now, you know, I, I, even going to concerts, you know, like, do I like good music? Hell yeah. But, you know, going to a big concert and just, you know, being around so many people, it's just like, I don't know. It's, I don't we, I think we're living in just like, times of drastic change you know we're you know we're, we're starting to realize even through this whole thing that's going on that people are really showing their true colors you know it's like you know the people that sometimes uh you thought you're the were your friends you know if uh, they've kind of fallen to the wayside you know like the circle of friendship have, was gone like kind of like this to like this and that's okay you know i'd rather have like less you know people in my life that actually like really truly give a fuck then, you know, a big circle of people that are just trying to get something out of you, you know, it's, I don't know. Yeah, it's kinda... for sure. Yeah. So I was going to say, you are definitely an inspiration through your pain. I have so much admiration for people that keep on keeping on and obviously take action to give back through their personal experiences. This empowers people. Do you feel empowered when you ignite people's perspective on life? Mm. I don't, I don't feel empowered at all. I'm just being me. It makes me way happier. A huge thing you want to help. You want to be happy, do something for somebody else, be selfless. So the best way to bring immediate happiness, this is, uh, I won't, I won't say it, but yeah, smile. I, to this, since I was a kid and you go back through all my yearbooks and 
high school, university, and somebody in there has written, one day I hope to know why you're smiling all the time. (laughs) (laughs) You are always smiling. I don't think I've ever seen the frown on your face, ever. You know, I have- No wonder you're one of those five uh, people picked on the billboards. (laughs) I, I have plenty of days and moments and times where I'm not smiling. Yeah. But that's when I'm by myself. Yeah. Because a smile can go a real long way when you're out in public. Uh, you don't know what the other person's going through from the lady at Tim Hortons that just handed you your coffee and forgot the straw. I guess people don't drink coffee with straws, but uh, <laughs> that's awesome. But the person that hit at Tim Hortons who forgets to give you your straw or your napkin. Maybe they forgot that because they found out their best friend died that morning, but they still got their ass to work. Doesn't give me the right to be rude to them. I don't, I don't know what they're going through. They could be going through exactly what I was going through five and a half years ago, five years ago. And all it was, was a smile that somebody gave me that changed my life and saved my life. I don't have to put in any effort, but smile to potentially change a person's life. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, not keep smiling. He's smiling. <laughs> about that makes me smile all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's uh God, it's, a, it's such a good message. A smile can really change someone's day. You know, you just you never know what other people are going through. And you know, it's just the human condition. You know, people are a lot of people suffer in the physical world. That's just the way it is. And you embrace it. And you say, you know what, I'm here for who knows how long and I'm going to do whatever the best I can while I'm here and just keep on moving forward. It's like, you know, it's uh, sometimes easier said than done. But when you get going, you get the momentum going to actually like, you know, where you're doing something or pursuing something, you know, like what's success, you know, success to me is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal you know, something worthy. You're progressing towards something that is worthy. So then that makes you feel worthy. And, you know, that which creates more well-being and the more well you are, the more you can do, the more you can contribute to society instead of take. So it's like, you know, I believe the more that we, you know, contribute to life, the more life actually gives back to us. Yep. On an energetic uh, uh, spectrum as well. You know, it's it's the more Perfect. the more you give, the more uh, and it's like going to the gym. You know, sometimes you go to the gym and you feel like a bag of snot, you go in there for two hours and you sweat, your, you know, what off and you come out and you feel like a million bucks. Yeah. I shouldn't say a million bucks. because I don't know what that even feels like. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I, I most certainly agree on that. <laughs> Had it, but don't, I don't know what it feels like because money is just inert matter anyways, too. It's only something they have access for a certain amount of time. It's never really yours. The only people that yeah. make money is a mint, you know? It's man-made. You just have access to for, to it for a certain amount of time. I'm not taking anything with me when I go, but hopefully I can leave a little bit uh, back for you know the people that care, you know I care about, whatever. But uh, I, my journey's not over yet. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Far from it. That's my intention. Um, all right. So let's. Uh, what is your main message to the world, Jill? What's your main message? Oh, my main message. Can't it just be everything that I just said? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of messages there. I don't know. We might have to get some extra envelopes yeah. shipped out to you. Yeah. <laughs> Go to squirrels. Um, squirrels. Forgive. Forgive. Yeah. Yeah. Forgive. Um, be and kind. Once that forgiveness. Yeah. Once that forgiveness can be can be shifted into being thankful for whatever you you were forgiving. Find a lot of healing. And yeah. Just smile. Just smile. Yeah. And gratitude too, I would imagine, which all encompasses what you just said, you know, grateful for a beautiful yeah. smile. I think everybody smiles beautiful. Yeah. I really do. doesn't matter if they're missing chiclets or not. <laughs> I still think their smile is beautiful. At least they're trying, you know? Yeah. That's it. All right. So how do our listeners follow your journey? I know you're on Instagram and social media and, you know, you got your beautiful photos on there. You're at Camp My Way. So uh, give us the goods here. How can we follow Jillian Brown, the first lady on all of well, our map? <laughs> <laughs> um, Instagram is the best 
for probably most everything. Um, my photography, uh, it's basically my online portfolio, as well as every photo, make sure to read what's written with it. Yeah. Cause there's always words. There's either a, a really great story, um, or I try to be wise. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, Instagram, Jillian A. Brown Photography, um, as well as Camp My Way on Instagram, campmyway.com, um, to find out more about that program, um, whether it's supporting or you want to talk to us um, a little bit more about the program. Um, yeah, Facebook, the same, Jillian A. Brown Photography or Jill A. Brown, whatever. You're all over the place. Yeah, that's the best. Well, social media. When yeah. you're out in the backcountry, I was going to say you're, you're out in the bush, but you're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, you got it. That's the the most unfortunate thing with what we do is I hate technology. Technology and oh. I do not get along. As well as everything I'm teaching is to be away from technology and disconnected from it to connect to self. Unfortunately, to spread those messages, you have yeah. to be connected on these devices. Um, the, the most important thing with those things, with being on social media and having technology and all of that is to use it for a purpose. Yeah. Um, not just use it. It's, yeah. a, it's a drug. It's the worst addiction on the absolute planet these days. Um, it causes the most suicides on the planet yeah. is social media. Oh, absolutely. Um, causes the most disorders. It causes the most Every, trauma triggers whatever you want to word it is social media so unless you need to utilize it for some means um of sharing something of educating for work whatever that may be um that's the only way it should be used absolutely yeah i know i went i went off social media for a couple of years there and my life was completely different i i just i felt like i was 15 years old again and just no worries or whatever. It's just like you just after, after a week of like being off it, I was just did not care anymore. I know who my friends are. I can call them up whenever I want. I don't have to but, like, you know, I like photo albums too. I like going back into the old days and looking at my parents' photo albums and stuff like that's now it's like your photo albums plastered all over Instagram which is okay. But I, like, I, you know, I firmly believe that there's like wicked, totally positive messages on Instagram. So when you get into that habit of like scrolling and liking and da, 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 I really like, I mean, for all those people out there, I mean, it's not like I don't care, but like the people that I'm closest to are the ones that I follow. I can, you know, and I see what they're doing and I always read what they're doing. Always. It's the intention of like, what's behind yeah. the photo, you know, it might be a nice photo of them, but what's underneath the photo is like, you know, there's a story to that photo. So then it attaches you to that and it can, you know, gives you that connectivity of like the humanism behind the in the moment shot of social media. Da, 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 da. I got to have these shoes, a Gucci purse and a, you know, a nice night out at uh, Cardero's, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> does it really matter? <laughs> you know, people taking pictures of their food or going to a restaurant. Yeah. You see these people on a date or whatever, and they don't say two words to each other. They're for an hour and a half or where, however they're, along they're you know, having dinner for or whatever. And they're on their phones the whole time. <laughs> it's like, really? Like, where did true human connection actually, like, have to come to this point? But just goes back to the whole, you know, it, it is... It's part of the now. It's going to be part of our future for, you know, who knows? It's, I think it's a forever thing as long as that we're going to be existing here. You know, there's always, you know, it just is what it is. So you just use it the way you want to use it. And hopefully it's, you know, has good impacts on people's lives. I know it's, your, yours inspires a lot of people. I mean, there's a lot of people that follow you. So, and it's not about the followers. I do my, <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> I, I can tell just about helping one i think you do your best at everything you do that's a good trait <laughs> i definitely put in a lot of effort that's awesome maybe to a fault at times <laughs> to a yeah i know i extreme just a little bit <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> 
All right. Well, I mean, I think we covered a lot there, Jill. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being our first lady, a class act on all over the map. It's been an absolute honor, Jill. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be the first female too. There's a <laughs> lot of good ones out there to pick from. I think you're the best. Yeah, we're putting you on the pedestal here. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, now you do have a lot to live up for. That's your responsibility. <laughs> you can take it. You got you're, you're you're always up for a challenge, so I'm not worried about you. <laughs> yeah, I am. Oh man. Jeez. Do I get a trophy? You do. It's in the mail. We all as long as it's not an eighth place ribbon, I'll accept it. I got to make it out of clay tonight before I go to bed. So uh, it might be a transformer <laughs> like Optimus Prime or Bumblebee. Okay. <laughs> I'll Actually, accept that. No, 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 no. It's going to be a squirrel. It will be, oh, a, yeah. it'll be, it'll be a squirrel eating a nut. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's call it. So uh, thank you very much again and uh, give my best to Terrence and um, yeah, okay. kind regards to everybody out there at Camp My Way in Pemberton, check them out on Instagram and uh, whatever social media platforms, see all the good things that they're doing. Thank you so much, Jill. Much love. Yeah. Nice to see you and talk to you again too. Peace. <laughs>